Chapter 110. Queequeg in his coffin. Upon searching, it was found that the casts last struck into the hold were perfectly sound, and the leak must be further off. So, it being calm weather, they broke out deeper and deeper, disturbing the slumbers of the huge ground-tier butts, and from that black midnight sending those gigantic moles into the daylight above. So deep did they go, and so ancient and corroded and weedy the aspect of the lowermost puncheons, that you could almost look from some boldy cornerstone cast containing coins of Captain Noah, with copies of the posted placards vainly warning the infatuated old world with the flood. Tierce after tierce, too, of water and bread and beef and shooks of staves and iron bundles of hoops were hoisted out, till at last the piled decks were hard to get about, and the hollow hull echoed underfoot, as if you were treading over empty catacombs and reeled and rolled in the sea like an air-freighted demijohn. Top-heavy was the ship as a dinnerless student with Aristotle in his hand. Well, it was that typhoons did not visit us then, visit them then. Now, as the time it was that my poor pagan companion and fast-bosom friend Queequeg was seized with a fever, which brought him nigh to his endless end. Be it said that in this vocation of whaling, sinecures are unknown, and dignity and danger go hand in hand till you get to be captain. The higher you rise, the harder you toil. So with poor Queequeg, who, as harpooner, must not only face all the rage of the living whale, but as we have elsewhere seen, mount his dead back in a rolling sea, and finally descend into the gloom of the hold, and bitterly sweating all day in that subterraneous confinement, resolutely manhandle the clumsiest casks and see to their stowage. To be short, among whalemen, the harpooners are the holders, so called. Poor Queequeg, when that ship was about half disemboweled, you should have stooped over the hatchway and peered down upon him there, where, stripped to his woolen drawers, the tattooed savage was crawling about amid the dampness and slime, like a green-spotted lizard at the bottom of a well, and a well or an ice house that somehow proved to him, poor pagan, where, strange to say, for all the heat of his sweatings, he caught a terrible chill, which lapsed into a fever, and at last, after some days' suffering, laid him in his hammock close to the very sill of the door of death. How he wasted and wasted away in those few long lingering days till there seemed but little left of him but his frame and tattooing. But as all else in him thinned, his cheekbones grew sharper, his eyes nevertheless seemed growing fuller and fuller, till they became of a strange softness of luster, and mildly but deeply looked out at you from there from his sickness, a wondrous testimony to that immortal health in him which could not die or be weakened. And, like circles on the water, which, as they grow fainter, expand, so his eyes seemed rounded and rounding, like the rings of eternity. And all that cannot be named would steal over you as you sat by the side of this waning savage and saw strange things in his face, and beheld who were bystanders when Zoroaster died. For whatever is truly wondrous and fearful in man never yet was put into words or books, and the drawing near of death, which alike levels all, alike impresses all with the last revelation, which only an author from the dead could adequately tell. So that, let us say it again, no dying Chaldee or Greek had higher or holier thoughts than those whose mysterious shades you saw creeping over the face of poor Queequeg as he quietly lay in his swaying hammock, and the rolling sea seemed gently rocking him to his final rest and the ocean's invisible flood tide lifted him higher and higher toward his destined heaven. Not a man of the crew but gave him up, and, as far as Queequeg himself, what he thought of his case was forcibly shown by a curious favor he asked. He called one to him in the gray morning watch when the day was just breaking, and, taking his hand, said that the while in Nantucket he chanced to see certain little canoes of dark wood, like the rich war wood of his native isle, and upon inquiry he had learned that all the whalemen who died in Nantucket were laid in those same dark canoes, and that the fancy of being so laid had much pleased him. For it was not unlike the custom of his own race, who, after embalming a dead warrior, stretched him out on his canoe, 
and so left them to be floated away to the starry archipelagos. For not only do they believe that the stars are isles, but that far beyond all visible horizons, their own mild, uncontinented seas interflow with the blue heavens, and so form the white breakers of the Milky Way. He added that he shuddered at the thought of being buried in his hammock, according to the usual sea custom, tossed like something vile to the death-devouring sharks. No, he desired a canoe like those of Nantucket, all the more congenial to him being a whaleman, that, like a whaleboat, these coffin canoes were without a keel, though that involved but uncertain steering and much leeway down, uh, down the dim ages. Now, when this strange circumstance was made known aft, the carpenter was at once commanded to do Queequeg's bidding, whatever it might include. There was some heathenish coffin-colored old lumber aboard, which, upon a previous voyage, had been cut for the aboriginal groves of the Lacadae Islands, and from these dark planks the coffin was recommended to be made. No sooner was a carpenter apprised of the order than taking his rule, he forthwith went all the indifferent pompitude of his character, proceeded to the forecastle, and took Queequeg's measure with great accuracy, regularly chalking Queequeg's person as he shifted the rule. Ah, poor fellow, he'll have to die now, ejaculated the Long Island sailor. Going to his vice bench, the carpenter, for convenience sake and general reference, now transferred, transferringly measured it to the exact length the coffin was to be, and then made the transfer permanent by cutting two notches at its extremities. This done, he marshaled the planks and his tools and went to work. When the last nail was driven and the lid duly placed and fitted, he lightly shouldered the coffin and went forward with it, inquiring whether they were ready for it yet in that direction. Overhearing the indignant but half-humorous cries with which the people on deck began to drive the coffin away, Queequeg, to everyone's consternation, commanded that the thing should instantly be brought to him. Nor was there any denying him, seeing that, of all mortals, some dying men are the most tyrannical, and certainly, since they will shortly trouble us so little forevermore, the poor fellows ought to be indulged. Leaning over in his hammock, Queequeg long regarded the coffin with an attentive eye. He then called for his harpoon, had the wooden stock drawn from it, and then had the iron part placed in the coffin along with one of the paddles of his boat. All by his own request, also biscuits were then ranged round the sides within. A flask of water was placed at the head and a small bag of woody earth scraped up at the hold at the foot, and a piece of sailcloth being rolled up for a pillow. Queequeg now entreated to be lifted into his final bed, that he might make a trial of its comforts, if any it had. He lay without moving a few minutes, then told one to go to his bag and bring out his little god Yojo. Then, crossing his arms on his breast with Yojo between them, he called for the coffin lid, hatch, he called it, to be placed over him. The head part turned over with a leather hinge, and there lay Queequeg in his coffin, with little but his composed countenance in view. Where am I? It will do, it is easy, he murmured at last, and signed to be replaced in his hammock. But ere this was done, Pip, who had been slyly hovering over by all this while, drew nigh to him where he lay, and, with soft sobbings, took him by the hand in the other, holding his tambourine. Poor rover, will ye never have done with all this weary roving? Where go ye now, but if the currents carry you to these sweet Antilles, where the beaches are only beat with water lilies, will ye do one little errand for me? Seek out Pip, who's been missing so long. I think he's in those far Antilles. If you find him, then comfort him, for he must be very sad. For look, he's left his tambourine behind. I found it. rig dig dig now Queequeg die, and I'll beat you your dying march. I've heard, muttered Starbuck, gazing down the scuttle, that in violent fevers men, all ignorance, have talked in ancient tongues. And that when the mystery is probed, it turns out that they were all that in their wholly forgotten childhood, those ancient tongues had been really spoken in their hearing by some lofty scholars. So to my fond faith, poor Pip, in this strange sweetness of his lunacy, brings heavenly vouchers of all our heavenly homes. Where learned he that but there? Hark, he speaks again, but more wildly now. 
Form two and two, let's make a general of him. Ho, where's his harpoon? Lay it across here. rig dig 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 huzzah. For our game cock now to sit upon his head and crow. Queequeg dies game. Mind ye, that Queequeg dies game. Take ye good heed of that. Queequeg dies game. I say game, game, game. But base little Pip, he died a coward. Died all a shiver. Out upon Pip. Hark ye if ye find Pip. Tell all the Antilles he's a runaway. A coward, a coward, a coward. Tell them he jumped from a whale boat. I'll never beat my tambourine over base Pip and hail him general. If he were once more dying here, no, no, shame upon all cowards, shame upon them. Let him go drown like Pip that jumped from his whaleboat, shame, shame. During all of this, Queequeg lay with closed eyes as if in a dream. Pip was led away and the sick man was replaced in his hammock. But now that he had apparently made every preparation for death, now that his coffin was proved a good fit, Queequeg suddenly rallied. Soon there seemed no need of the carpenter's box, and thereupon, when some expressed their delighted surprise, he in substance said that the cause of his sudden convalescence was this. At a critical moment he just recalled a little duty ashore, which he was leaving undone, and therefore he changed his mind about dying. He could not yet die, he averred. They asked him then whether to live or die was a matter of his own sovereign will and pleasure. He answered, certainly. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Nothing but a whale or a gale or some violent, ungovernable, unintelligent destroyer of that sort. Now, there is this noteworthy difference between a savage and civilized, that while a sick, civilized man may be six months convalescing, generally speaking, a sick savage is almost half well again in a day. So, in good time, my Queequeg gained strength, and at length, after sitting on the windlass for a few indolent days, but eating with a vigorous appetite, he suddenly leaped to his feet, threw out his arms and legs, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a bit, then, springing into the head of his hoisted boat, posing a harpoon, pronounced himself fit for a fight. With a wild whimsiness, he now used his coffin for a sea chest, and emptying it Emptying into it his canvas bag of clothes, set them there in order. Many spare hours he spent in carving the lid with all manner of grotesque figures and drawings, and it seemed that hereby he was striving in his rude way to copy parts of the twisted tattooing on his body, and this tattooing had been the work of a departed prophet and seer of his island, who, by those hieroglyphic marks, had written out on his body a complete hit theory of the heavens and the earth, and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth, so that Queequeg in his own proper person was a riddle to unfold, a wondrous work in one volume, but whose mysteries not even himself could read, though his own live heart beat against them, and these mysteries were therefore destined in the end to molder away with the living parchment, whereupon they were inscribed, and so be unsolved to the last." And this thought it must have been which suggested to Ahab that wild exclamation of his, when one morning, turning away from surveying poor Queequeg, O oh, devilish tantalization of the gods. This is the end of chapter 110. Now, Queequeg almost died. And one of the things that they talked about was that in the whaling, everybody works. Everybody, everybody works. There is nobody who just sits around. And the higher you are, up until being the captain, the harder you work. So Ishmael, down at the bottom, drawing a 177th lay, getting this tiny bit of money, works. And the carpenter works hard. And Queequeg and Dagu and Tashtigo, the harpooners, work really, really hard because they have to row they have to harpoon, they have to cut up the whale, they're doing all of the grunt work down in the holds, cleaning up the barrels and such. And so, as this, Queequeg ends up getting sick. Now, it's quite possible to get sick from mold. Um, several years ago, I had pneumonia, and it was quite possible that it was caused by dealing with moldy, moldy hay, and so... You know, once the, hay, once the moldy hay was spread out, I started feeling sick, and then it just slowly built up into pneumonia. And I was 
down. I was in the hospital. I was having fever dreams. I was about as close to death, maybe even closer to death than Queequeg was. And it was incredibly scary. So, you know, here I was. And much like Queequeg, once I got better, once I got better and up and moving, it was, okay, I am better. And, you know, like Ahab fighting against the, you know, fighting against his impairment, I was like, I want to stand, I want to walk, and I was fighting it, and just like Queequeg, fighting it. And it's kind of impressive, you know, Queequeg is like, he decided to live because he had something to do. And there are a lot of people who hang on, people who are going through cancer, people who are going through whatever, they stay alive for a particular purpose. Um, your dad's grandmother, uh, Hope, who you're named after, um, what? Elaine. Elaine. Sorry. Newer is Hope. You're named Elaine after her. Um, she had cancer and was advanced lung cancer. And she probably got it from being a smoker. So that's a good reason not to take up smoking. But anyway, she had advanced lung cancer. And she stayed alive long enough to see your dad graduate from high school. And that was her one thing. And she, she only lasted a few days past that. But that's what she wanted. And, you know, she was struggling and she was struggling and she stayed alive for that. And people can do amazing things if they will themselves to survive. Um, so keep that in mind. And also, one of the things that I love about this chapter is here you have Queequeg. And he saw coffins back in Nantucket. And he's like, oh, that's a canoe. And he wanted to be buried in a canoe. Because he just thought that was awesome. And it is kind of awesome. I mean, lots of people get buried in boats like that. Um, the Vikings. The Vikings are famous, were famous for their funerals. And I mean, this is one of those things. It's like Vikings. It's like, oh yeah, a Viking funeral. Well, what the Vikings did was the people who had a lot of money to have like boats to spare were put in their boat. And wood was piled up on the boat. And stuff was piled up on the boat with them. And the boat was set on fire and launched out to sea. So here you have this flaming boat with the Viking warrior. All of his stuff, well, not all of his stuff, but a lot of his stuff burning up with him. So this was, you know, this was kind of those one of those things to send them off. And the Egyptian pharaohs, in addition to being buried with stuff, including slaves, which was just absolutely horrible because what they would do is they would kill some of the slaves of the Pharaoh and bury them with the Pharaoh. So the Pharaoh would have slaves in the future, in the, you know, in the afterlife, which is, that's just horrible thing. But the Pharaohs were often uh, buried with boats because in the Egyptian eschatology, their belief of what happened after death, you crossed over to the far side of the Nile. So you crossed over to the other side of the Nile. And of course, if you're going to cross the Nile, you need a boat. So the pharaohs were buried with boats so that they could cross over the Nile. Around the world in 80... The funeral pyre. The funeral pyre, yes. The funeral pyre in... Uh, around the world in 80 days, where the wife was, was expected to be burned along with the husband, which, you know, as I said then and I'm saying again now is terrible because you don't want to burden the living with the dead or you know burden the living because of the dead um though Ishmael makes a point that you know it burdening the living with the dying is okay because you know it's like okay we'll grant their last request because you know they aren't going to be here to bug us much longer anyway um so Usually people who are dying get caught a little bit, give get given a little bit of slack, and that's probably a good thing. 
But uh, anyway, so Queequeg wanted to be buried in his canoe because the typical way that they buried people who died at sea back then was they took them, they stitched up the hammock, maybe threw in some weight. Uh, you know, the Navy tradition was cannonballs, something that so the body sinks. And so they took the person, they weighted down, they sewed up the they sewed up their hammock, and they just tossed the hammock overboard, which is a very expedient way of doing things. And you know, by tying them up in the hammock and weighting the hammock down so that it sinks down to the bottom, you don't have the sharks to deal with. You don't have you know, well, you don't have the sharks to deal with, so the body gets returned to the ocean. And um. But Queequeg didn't want that because he didn't want to deal with the sharks. And he loved the idea of being buried in a canoe. And honestly, that's really kind of a good thing. to That's that's kind of a cool way to go out. Uh, the Viking funeral, or in Queequeg's case, it was just like he wanted his body set in the canoe and then pushed out in the water. That's the way his people supposedly did it. Um I don't know if I've ever heard of anything, any culture that takes the living body like, or takes the dead body like that and just kind of sets it adrift. Um, there probably are some that did it. Uh, none of them come to mind, but anyway, that's an interesting funeral, right? And I also love how Queequeg took his coffin and used it as a sea chest. You know, a lot of people would be like, this reminds me of almost dying. This is, and you no, know, Queequeg is like, this is a trophy. You know, this is me beating death. It's like, hey, this is a great box. I'm going to use it to store stuff in. So Queequeg took his coffin and made it into a sea chest and then proceeded to start tracing the tattoos that covered his body onto the sea chest. And there's some talk that the tattoos are this wisdom of ages that the prophet who tattooed them on him understood, but Kwekwe didn't, even though, you know, it's part of him. It's like, okay, this is all the secrets of the universe, and it's tattooed on Kwekwe's body, and Kwekwe is like, I don't know what it means. But this is truth. This is knowledge. So, Kwekwe almost died, and it's like, one chapter, Kwekwe was fine, then he was this hollow, wasted thing, and now he's fine again, and... Ready for a fight to hunt whales.